your experts today are going to be um, Paul and myself, Avni. Uh, Paul, as many of you may know, uh, has been with Francis Financial for eight years now. He has uh, more tenure than I do at Francis Financial. And uh, he has this um, alphabet soup behind his name, a lot of uh, great expertise. Um, and I will let Paul say hello. Thank you, Avni. And our hope, our expectation today is to have this be much more of a conversation. So for those of you who are joining us live, please do feel free to ask us questions and we'll even try to address them as we go. Uh, we might need to leave some toward the end, but we do hope to hear from you today. Excellent. So just to do a quick market review, what happened this past quarter? So quarter three, which was basically uh, July, August, and September, um, we had a really good third quarter. The U.S. stock market was up 1.16%, really good performance. Uh, we had a little bit of a challenging time in the international developed stocks which was down almost 1%, and emerging market stock, which took a bigger hit uh, at a negative 4.25%. And Paul here will talk about what happened in those markets and why they suffered uh, in this past quarter. Uh, but we also saw the US bond market do really, really well. So it's been a solid third quarter, and we're very uh, excited about how the year has also turned out. So let's take a quick look at what happened in 2019, just as we look at from the beginning of the year through the end of the third quarter, uh, US stocks are up more than 20% since January 1st. Now, granted, this has a lot to do with where they ended um, last year in, uh, on December 31st. It was a really low point, but they have come roaring back up and are up more than 20% for this year. The first quarter was phenomenal. Uh, with at almost a 14% return. Uh, and then the second quarter and the third quarter became a little bit more reasonable, but overall it's been a great year for uh, just the US stock market. Uh, if we look at historically speaking, so if we look at the past 10 years, uh, the S&P 500, the largest 500 companies in the US, uh, and we track what their performance is. And the way we measure that is uh, with a price to earning ratio. What are investors willing to pay? So the price uh, by, uh, you know, depending on the uh, earnings that these companies are expected to have. So how much are they willing to pay versus the earnings that they're willing to have? And this, uh, the teal line that you see here tracks that ratio for the 500 largest companies in the US. And if you see, you know, towards the beginning of the graph, so September uh, 2009, 10, 11, it went down, but then starting around September 2013, it's just been on a up swing. And now we're at about 20.45 ratio, and which essentially means that uh, the stock market is overpriced. U.S. stock market, if we look at historically speaking, investors are willing to pay much more than the earnings that these companies are supposed to produce, which is not a good thing because you don't want to pay. You don't want to do a bad deal. You don't want to pay more for what for something than it's worth. So we really think that the stock market is overpriced at this point. Yeah, and so looking at things on a global scale, as Avni mentioned, international stocks did not have the strongest Q3. However, most major markets have had a very strong 2019 so far. So again, third quarter just encapsulates 
the summer months of July, uh, July, August, and September. But if we look back from what has happened since the start of the year, you can see across the board, most major economies have done quite well. Canada at over 20% return, which is comparable to what we've seen here in the US. Uh, even Europe is in double digits, Japan at 11% and so on. Uh, only South Africa is one of the, the only major market that has seen a negative performance thus far. And in the third quarter, one of the largest factors that dragged down international stock performance was really for US-based investors. And it had to do with the rising US dollar. So if you look at returns of these markets in their home currencies, so for instance, uh, the French stock market in Euro or the Japanese in Yen, it tells a somewhat different story. And so that in, in total, in their home currencies, developed international stocks were actually up 1.7%, which contrasts the figure that Avni cited before, where if you convert from the home currencies to the US dollar, as a US based invest investor, you actually saw a slight loss. Uh, emerging market stocks, again, priced in their home currency, were down just about 2%, which in the face of trade war concerns isn't all that bad. And again, looking at it uh, from the start of the year, we've seen really strong returns across the board. And then further to add another comparison against the US stock market, Avni mentioned the PE ratio and how here in the US it's above that historical average. So that top line here is represented in teal. And you can see where it ended up as September 30th was about, you're paying $20 for every $1 of earnings. Where in that darker, we'll call it black, is developed international as a lower PE ratio. So it's more attractive pricing. And even further below that is the emerging markets. And that blue color is at 12.65%. And so while it's fantastic to see the US do very well uh, economy-wise as well as the stock market, we do have a pause for concern of perhaps right now prices are trading at, at highs and we might see a bit of a pullback. Great, thank you. So just in terms of a longer term view, what happens and, you know, we're not looking at what happened this past quarter because that's, that's not the right measure. We have to look at what these markets have been doing over a longer period of time. Yeah, as that's right, because right now we've only talked about three months and nine months, which to us, it's a, it's a short period of time. It's not long enough to really be able to assess things and uh, be able to suss them out for how, what they might look going forward. So if we do look at over five years and 10 year time horizons, you'll see green across the board, particularly here in the US. Uh, we're seeing double digit returns both in the 10 year time frame as well as the five year time frame. And just to clarify, these are annualized returns. So it means that, for instance, we're, uh, if we were looking at the 10 years there, the US stock market has averaged 13% returns every year, which is phenomenal. Um, we're also seeing strong returns from non-US stocks, about 5% return for developed and about 3.5% for emerging markets. And US bonds are also returning a nice uh, growth rate over the last 10 years, as well as over the last five years. What this also shows us is that there is variance of returns across the board, which as an investor, the idea of diversification is that you're not necessarily going to see all of these asset classes moving in the same direction or quite to the same growth rate as one another. That would defeat the purpose of having a diversified portfolio. And that's very evident in the one-year time frame. 
where we see actually U.S. bonds have vastly outperformed stocks both here in the U.S. and abroad. And it really goes to show that importance of having all of these different asset classes to some varying degree make up your portfolio. That's right. And so let's now take a step back from these returns and figure out just in the last quarter, in the summer months, as Paul mentioned, what has been going on in the news that's impacting the markets. And, you know, every time something comes along, you feel like, oh, this is not really like anything before, but, um, you know, this time it's different. But really, if you take a step back and look at the longer term perspective, you realize that the markets do their job and they really, um, you know, over a long period of time, having a diversified portfolio um, really helps you pull through those what seem like crises. Uh, talking about crisis, <laughs> this is uh, the impeachment inquiry seems to be one of them. Um, or it's made out to be one of them. We want to see, and you know, we're not going to get into the politics of the impeachment, uh, but just think about and look at how has this incident uh, impacted the market, and how has this, in this incident, such as this, impacted the markets in the past. So we looked at two of the major impeachments. Um, well, I think the only impeachments, I don't know. But yeah, at least the, the two big ones that come to mind is uh, Clinton and uh, President Nixon. So we looked at what happened when President Clinton was undergoing this, uh, this impeachment process. And we tracked it over, you know, many months and, you know, over the years that uh, this was going on. And the orange chart, the orange uh, line that you see, or a worm crawl that you see, is the S&P 500. Uh, the S&P 500 index made up of the largest 500 companies in the U.S. And here it looks like the impeachment events, although in the short run may have had some impact downwards or upwards but in the long run the stock market was just going up and it didn't seem to have a huge impact uh, on the stock market so let's look at the other impeachment uh, inquiry where oops um, the other impeachment inquiry was um, the Watergate scandal for when, when President Nixon was going through this process. And again, you see that there were incidents, you know, news that came out where it negatively impacted the market, but then there was news that came out that was positively impacting the market. And overall, this S&P 500 chart shows that the market had a tough time. But we have to take a step back and remember that this, this was in the 1970s the market was in general having a very tough time. Unemployment was at historical highs. Uh, there were a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of bad news coming out of the economy. There was inflation was high, there was stagnation, uh, and just economic policies were very poorly uh, run. So we saw uh, that this was a tough, Mar time for, for the stock market for those reasons and may not have anything to do with the impeachment uh, scandal. So those two incidents definitely show us, oops, hold on, I'm going backwards. <laughs> uh, those two incidents definitely show that, um, you know, there is no definite link between impeachment and the performance of the markets. We can't really correlate how one incident uh, affects the overall market. There are so many different um, forces at play that we need to think about it as a whole. And we also saw some other news come out uh, just in terms of the broader economy. Um, there was talks about um, you know, the economic slowdown. 
Uh, and yes, you know, the economy ha is not growing at the robust rate that it was growing in the past few quarters. Uh, and, but the, and the growth rate has slowed down, but there is still growth in the economy. That is one thing to remember that it may not be growing, the economy may not be growing as fast as it was before, but it's still growing and that's important. Uh, one of the big news that came out was that um, the jobs market did really well. So a lot of jobs were uh, added to the economy and they were at a, uh, at a high a level of income too. So it, that was great news for the economy. Something else that happened, a Federal Reserve uh, cut rates, interest rates twice this quarter. Uh, again, the Federal Reserve tries to maintain uh, the interest rates so that the economy doesn't grow too fast. It doesn't heat up too much uh, to keep inflation in check. And they had to cut rates twice so that the inflation is kept at check while uh, spurring the economy forward. So it was uh, definitely a good thing. And what, you know, the other good thing, the impact that the, cut, the rate cuts have it, that you feel directly as a consumer is your mortgage rate. So we are actually going through uh, and looking at what, our, what the mortgage rates are for all our clients and contacting those that have higher rates that might be able to refinance at a lower rate and get their um, monthly uh, expenses down. So, you know, the, the jobs growth and the rate cuts really boosted the performance of the stocks and bonds in the US market. And they were a major force behind the growth in the stocks and bonds. So that's always a good sign from our perspective. Uh, we also have some international things, international um, events that occurred, and Paul will talk a little bit about those. Yeah, and as I mentioned earlier, here as a U.S.-based investor, anytime putting your money into foreign markets, you do take on that additional risk of foreign exchange uh, losing value against the U.S. dollar, because it's similar to any time you travel abroad and you're exchanging your dollars for another currency, you know, it's always favorable to have a strong US dollar in that instance. However, if you are holding a lot of foreign currency and then you want to convert it back to the US dollars, you then take a hit. And so in the short term, that's what happened for a lot of investors who were investing in companies that are abroad is that they did see their performance take a hit because of the strengthening US dollar and why the dollar strengthened. Um, generally speaking, there was Brexit. So it's typically politically driven, some political concerns. So it was Brexit as well as the trade war concerns as well. Um, but we really saw it across the board and it's evident here in the third quarter, very few, a handful of foreign currencies strengthened against the dollar. You can see the Egyptian pound, Turkish lira, as well as the Israeli, Israeli shekel. But for the large part, you can see uh, most currencies did weaken against the dollar. So the Canadian dollar, the British pound, the euro. So some of the larger currencies uh, did lose value against the, the dollar, which served as a headwind to US-based foreign investors. And so we've, we've talked uh, about various factors thus far. We've thrown a lot at you, which I can imagine is very overwhelming. So bottom line is how should smart investors like yourselves react in the face of all of these different global concerns? And to us, it's always a relatively simple answer, and that's diversify, diversify, diversify. And oftentimes we find that investors are comparing a diversified portfolio to a single benchmark, such as the S&P 500. Now, if you're here in the US, you turn on the news, 
more often than not, newscasters are going to say the market was up today. Whenever they're talking about the market, they're usually talking about the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones, which is a very limited view on the overall global economy. Uh, to us, the S&P 500 is a great proxy, a great benchmark for U US stocks. However, it should not typically be the largest or the single one component of any one's portfolio. So if we look at this scenario here, where a diversified portfolio is about 40% in US stocks, 15% in non-US stocks, and another 40 or 35% in bonds, looking at how having that portfolio versus just US stocks would have done over the last 20 years, a diversified portfolio would have made you more money. Now that sounds great. It sounds like, okay, I can just kind of set it and forget it. But what we realize is that money and emotions go hand in hand. And so if we look at each of these different time frames, you realize that it's, it's kind of hard to hold on to uh, and staying disciplined with a diversified portfolio because in the first three years of the 2000s, S&P 500 took a huge hit, almost lost 40%. If you had a diversified portfolio, it would have been down just 16%. Now it's easy to say that in hindsight because we know that it eventually rallied, but at the time losing 16% of your money could feel really bad. So your feeling at the time would have been, I lost money. Then the next several years, US stock market really rallied strongly as did the global economy at large. And so having a diversified portfolio would have netted you a return of almost 75%, but it would have been less than what the S&P 500 did. And so then you would, at that time, have felt like I didn't make as much as, you know, look at, look at what's going on with the stock market here in the US. You know, how come my, my friend is doing so much better and I should get out and, and just put all my money in Apple stock? Well, and I'm not gonna go through each and every one of these steps, but essentially it's a similar story each step of the way. So it is, it's not the easiest thing in the world to, uh, to be an investor, especially when you have all of these different things at play. However, what we do see is really having a diversified portfolio does work. And oftentimes it makes sense to have an objective guidance, like working with us, um, to be able to see the long-term picture and not just want to dive into just having all, all your money in U.S. stocks or keeping all your money in cash. And this also ties, this slide here is uh, I think a nice graphic in that it ties into what Avni was talking about before, where, you know, we do live in times where there's a lot of uncertainty, especially politically. And so what this takes a look here is some crises, for lack of a better word, uh, that have happened in the last 30 plus years and how the market responded every time after that. And what we see here is that there's usually an initial spook that happens and investors are will see some short-term losses however if they stay invested they'll recoup their money typically sometimes fairly quickly like what we saw in october of 1987 saw a 19 percent return after just one year um, and then a 33 percent return after three years 76 percent after five years it's a little tougher when whatever is going on in the economy or in the political arena uh, takes a little bit of a bigger hit. Uh, so if we look at the March 2000, the dot-com crash, it was only a 2% return after one year, only a 2% return after three years, but then boom, there's a 51% return after five years. Essentially what we're trying to show here is that having a balanced strategy, a combination of stocks and bonds, an investor is armed to be able to overcome any sort of 
crisis, as large as it might seem at that time, it ends up really being a blip on the radar. And so it's, you're able to have um, a long-term perspective to be able to have the discipline to ride out any short-term storm. And so that comes down to our mantra, our mantra for any investor is to keep calm and stay invested. Well said. I love that. Um, so just, you know, I, we, we hope that that gave you enough uh, information that when the next time a crisis rolls around, and it will, uh, we have the, this information with us to know that if we stay disciplined, if we have a well diversified portfolio, and uh, you know we are uh, weathering all these crises, we just we hang in there and we stay invested. In the end, the markets have a way of taking care of us and uh, taking care of um, our portfolios. Um, and you know it's really important to have a good team behind you. Uh, we are very proud of ours. Um, we've received several awards uh, in the past years that have recognized us for the work that we do uh, and the dedication that we have to our clients. Uh, and um, we feel very uh, happy with that recognition. Uh, something else that we could offer to you, we do these events called Money Conversation Circle. Um, sorry, it's women only, so any men in the audience, um, you know, if there are women in your lives that can uh, benefit from this, please feel free to extend this invitation to them. Uh, but these conversation circles is really bringing together women, 10 to 15 women, and talking about money, uh, this it helps us feel more comfortable with the way we think about it. It gives us an opportunity to actually think and, and reflect on what we think about uh, money. Uh, the next Conversation Circle event is on socially conscious investing, how to align our portfolios with our values. And it's on Thursday, December 5th. Um, it's from 6.30 to 9 at our offices. Uh, please RSVP by emailing sunana at francisfinancial.com. We'd love to have you. Uh, and if you have a friend that wants to come along that, uh, that uh, might benefit from this, definitely, um, definitely invite them as well. Uh, we'll, you know, we had the lines open up for questions. We'll take a quick pause and see if uh, there might be any questions that you have. Um, it doesn't look like it, it, but right now is not the only opportunity. If you ever have any questions or need help, we're only an email or a phone call away. So please feel free to reach out. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful week ahead, and um, we hope you join us next time. Take care, everyone.